Hey, Darius Daniels here, man, lead pastor of Change Church. Uh, I hope you are about to be blessed. I hope you are. This is a message called I'm Looking for More. I want you to know that there are times when we're looking for more from God, but then there are times where God knows there's more in us. This message is going to help you wrestle with that tension. I hope it blesses you, and I have one request. I do have an ask, and that is if it blesses you, would you please just send it to somebody else? Take care. Enjoy hey. the message. Well, man, God is good. Amen. Well, listen, we are, we're in a series here called I'm Looking for Something, and um, this is, this, uh, on today, there is a passage found in the Gospel of Luke. Whenever you see the word gospel, it just simply means good news, and so the Gospel of Luke is the good news about Jesus from Luke's perspective, and so Luke says something here, I think, uh, that's very significant in Luke 5. Um, uh, chapter number five, verse number one, it says this, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him, listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats that had been left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let down nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish. I want to see if you... I hadn't said it, but I want to know, did you, <laughs> are you hearing what I hadn't said? Because I don't know, I, this is my fourth time teaching this today, but I just saw something I hadn't seen in all the other three services. It says they caught such a large number of fish. I pray this happens to you in 2024, that their nets begin to break. 115, you're not loud enough. I said their nets begin to break. I'm praying for net breaking blessing. My God. Their nets begin to break. So they signaled, not to anybody random, but to their partners. In the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full, they began to sink. In part three of this series, I'm looking for something. I want to talk from this subject. I'm looking for more. If that's you, clap your hands all over the building. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, one of the phrases that is used to describe our enemy and our adversary is a phrase or a description called the prince of darkness. And one of the reasons Satan is depicted and described as the prince of darkness is not simply because darkness is a metaphor for evil. It is. But darkness is also a metaphor for ignorance. If I am ignorant, I'm in the dark. And ignorance, family, is not the absence of intellect. It doesn't mean I don't have the capacity to know. Ignorance is the absence of information. It means I don't know. So it is not just the absence of information is the absence of accurate information because it is possible to be informed but misinformed and so the enemy is an enemy that operates in the arena of ignorance he wants to keep us in the dark because we're in your, when you're in the dark, you're more vulnerable than you are in the light. Come on, talk to me. Most people who may stub their toe aren't stubbing their toe when it's light. 
Many people who are stubbing their toe are stubbing their toe in the dark. And what the enemy wants to do is to keep you and I in the dark. He wants us uninformed or misinformed because he knows ignorance is expensive. He knows whatever area I'm ignorant in, I suffer in. He's aware of what was proclaimed by the prophet Hosea that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And he wants us to be ignorant or uninformed or misinformed about a number of areas. And one of the areas he wants us misinformed in is in our theology. Somebody say theology. Our study of God. There are some things he doesn't want you to know. Because if you're not informed, you can't expect. And if you don't expect, you don't acquire. I'm going to say it one more time. If you are not informed, you can't expect. And if you can't expect, you can't acquire. And so one of the ways the enemy keeps us from, from acquiring is to keep us from being informed about what we should expect. But I came today to give the devil a black eye and to let the devil know this is a teaching house. This is an informed house. We want more than inspiration and nursery rhymes in this house. We came through traffic. We stood in line because we need a word from the Lord. I'm raising kids. Don't play with me. I'm playing bills. Don't play with me. I'm navigating decisions. Don't play with me. I need a word. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word will stand forever. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I need a word. He wants us misinformed or uninformed about certain aspects of God. Because the God you see is the God you get. Pastor, where'd you get that? The Bible? In Mark chapter number six, the Bible says Jesus goes to his hometown and he goes to the temple, to the synagogue. He begins to teach. And the Bible says when as he's teaching, there are people there who say, is this not the carpenter's son? And the Bible says, I told you just a few weeks ago, the Bible says he, he could not do many mighty miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. So a few people got what was available for many because everybody saw him, but only a few saw him right. And those that saw him right got what others didn't get. If you can see him in a way that others can't see him, you can have what others don't get. And I want to know, am I talking to anybody at the 115 that say, I want it all. I cried too much not to have it all. I've been through too much not to have it all. Let me go old school before old school Sunday. Lord, I'm running. Trying to make a hundred. Ninety-nine and a half just won't do. If you want it all, give him a I want it all praise right here. He wants us uninformed or misinformed about God because the God you see is the one you get. If the only thing he can do in your mind is give you a one-way ticket to heaven, then all you will get from him is a one-way ticket from heaven to heaven. This is why I don't insult anyone when they have an experience with God that's different than mine. What I don't let them do in my presence is insult my religion. This religion thing don't work for you. It's keeping me alive. It's giving me joy and sorrow. It's giving me hope for tomorrow. It's not working for you. It's working for me. He wants us uninformed or misinformed about theology, about God. And there's something that I want to make sure 
that we understand and embrace in our time together. It's an attribute of God that's extremely important, but often overlooked. And I need you to understand this because this understanding will ease your anxiety when it comes, when it comes to God's timetable for doing certain things in your life. Everybody listen to me. God is a finisher. Did you hear what I just said? God is a finisher. Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying, in other words, he may from time to time work incrementally, but he never works incompletely. That if he starts a thing, you better believe before the dust settles, he will finish it. I can say this because the Bible says in Philippians chapter 1 verse number 6, being confident in this. He. Y'all better come get me there. My burden bearer. He. My heavy load sharer. He. My way out of nowhere. He. Jehovah Jireh. He. Jehovah Shama. He. Who began. A good work in you will carry it in on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. If he started it, he will finish it. Because finishing isn't just an activity for him. Finishing is an attribute of him. It's not just something that he does. It's who he is. He said in Revelation 22, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. He said, I'll start it. Y'all better come get me. And I'll finish it. And I speak this over somebody's life prophetically. He's getting ready to finish. You didn't hear what I just said. I said, I know there was progress and it looked like it stalled. It looked like it stopped. It seemed like momentum was heading in the right direction. And now all of a sudden, it seems as if things are not progressing the same way. I came to tell you, God's getting ready to finish it. Somebody don't wait until he finish it to give him praise. Somebody give him a finishing praise right now. It's not finished, but he's a finisher. It's not finished, but he's a finisher. It's not finished. He's getting ready to do it. 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 I don't see it yet, but he's getting ready to do it. I don't feel it yet, but he's getting ready to do it. And since he's getting ready to do it, I'm getting ready to praise him. When I think... He's a finisher. Let me see it. Let me see it. Let me see it. I got 16 minutes. Let me see. See. He's, he's a finisher. And see, this truth should provide hope for hard times. This is why the enemy wants us ignorant of this truth. Because if I'm unaware of the truth that he is a finisher, I'll have anxiety about what's unfinished. See, Paul says in Corinthians, he says, let Satan get an advantage of you, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So my ignorance, watch this, is the place where Satan has the advantage. So when God addresses the ignorance, he removes the advantage. 
Am I making sense? So this is something the enemy, he doesn't want us to know God's a finisher. Because some of our anxiety is about stuff that started headed in the right direction. And then it stopped. But you need to know. He's a finisher. Now watch this. If he's a finisher and we are made in his image (laughs) and in his likeness, then it means that we should be finishers also. I don't have time to bother this. No other service got this. But you are a finisher because the finisher is in you. So when you say, I can't finish, you write. But greater is he. That is in me than he I know I know that's NIV but King John said in a well do it for in NIV says proper time KJV says in due season now outside the kingdom there are four seasons winter spring summer fall but inside the kingdom it's five winter spring summer fall and due season some people are in winter the rest of us we in due season I'm due for my season you will reap If you faint not, I don't have time. Satan is counting on you fainting. Jesus is praying you don't. Simon, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Fin- he counting on you, not finishing. See, because here's, <laughs> here's the quandary. The quandary, the, the complexity is this. We know we need to finish. But sometimes our definition or our understanding of when we finish and God's perspective on when we finish not the same sometimes I'm like I'm not finished and God's like yes you are and then there are times where I'm like I'm finished And God's like, no, you not. And managing this tension is key and critical for every believer. I see an example of this in this particular passage. The the, the Bible says something incredibly unique. It says Jesus is standing by this particular lake. I want you to see something. He's journeying through the plains of a place called Gennesaret and he decides as was his nature to teach. His teaching is tactical. Come on, whatever area I'm ignorant in, I suffer in. I'm not even going to bother this. But he did more teaching in the Bible than touching. He says, because if you, some stuff, y'all, y'all, He did more teaching than touching. He says, because some stuff, if you get the teaching, you don't need the touch. He says, some miracles become unnecessary on the back end when you get the teaching on the front end. 
No pastor, experience is the best teacher. No, experience sometimes is the most effective teacher, but it's also the most expensive teacher. It costs too much to learn everything the hard way. So, so as was his custom, he teaches. And the text says this, he notices two boats that belong to fishermen who were washing their nets. Somebody say, Pastor. Pastor. Come on, 115. Pastor. Say, Pastor. Pastor. Why, Why were they washing their nets? Were they washing their nets? Here's why. They thought they were finished. They've been fishing. So in their mind, I'm cleaning my nets because I'm done for the day. Pastor, why did they think they were done for the day? There are a few reasons they could have thought they were done for the day. Number one, they could have thought they were done for the day because of failure. Because when we read the text, you'll see, you're about to see in a second, they had been fishing all night and caught nothing. And I know some of y'all, or most of y'all can't relate to this, because every time you try anything, it works. Every conversation you have work. Every initiative you launch work. But, but if you've ever... dealt with failure, you'll know the enemy uses failure as a weapon to ruin your confidence. I don't even have time. Hebrews says, cast not away your confidence for it has a great reward. And the enemy wants to use the failure in the past to erode and eradicate your confidence in the future. He wants you to be so, and me, to be so focused on what didn't work that you're not focused on what can work. Shata. Y'all better come get me here. And I came to tell somebody in here today that your failure can be a prison that imprisons you or a school that educates you. You get to choose. You fail two directions. You either fail backwards or you fail forward. But they had dealt with failure. So they felt their failure was almost fatal to their faith. I'm done. I'm washing my nets. I'm through with this. This is not working. I'm out of here. But, but they not only dealt with failure, y'all know what else they dealt with? Uh, they dealt with frustration. See, it's one thing to work all night, miss sleep, inconvenience yourself, miss meals if you're catching something. But it is frustrating to exert all that energy, to extend all that effort in an attempt to catch something and come up with nothing. Frustration. Well, have you and I saying, I'm done with this. See, I'm, see. they dealt with failure. The failure impacted them practically. Here's what's interesting. But the frustration impacted them emotionally. See, the enemy wants to use frustration to create agitation. Because a lot of people, a lot of times the enemy uses agitation to cause people to abandon their assignment. (laughs) Did you hear what I just said? 
Yeah, uh, uh, it, it's like the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, because of the abundance of revelation, that, because of the abundance of revelation I see that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a message of Satan above me concerning this thing. I thought the Lord, sought the Lord three times that it might be removed from me. And on the third time, he said, my grace is sufficient. A, me, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger, angelos of Satan, to buffet me. It means to strike repeatedly. It's not killing me. It's just agitating me. I'm not injured, I'm just hurt. And he says, okay, the enemy wants to use that agitation to cause me to abandon the assignment because I don't have to take this. I make tents. Paul was a tent maker. Come on. Paul was in ministry and in the marketplace. So he had a way. And making tents during those days was equivalent of being in the development business. It's equivalent of building houses. So he like, I don't have to take this. Y'all not paying me this much. Let me... The enemy wants to use agitation to abandon assignment. That's what frustration will do. Frustration make you say, I'm, this, this too agitating. I'm done. So Failure made them want to quit. Okay. Frustration made them want to quit. Let me see if I can get an amen on this one. Fatigue. Yeah. Tech says they fish all night. It's morning. They sleepy. And here comes Jesus giving them a word when they tired. Jesus, did y'all hear what I just said? Jesus, here they are, tired. The fatigue had them ready to rest. But Jesus gives them a word in the midst of their fatigue. They out of energy. But they get instruction. Because when you follow the, y'all, it's not the reverse. God's like, I gave you instruction because I don't need energy. You trying to get up the energy to carry out the instruction. When the energy you need is on the other side of your obedience. When you step into obedience, you step into energy. Y'all miss Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. See, see, I don't know what's happened this service because I had an incredibly arduous week, unbelievably long week. I ran a coaching event this weekend, all day Friday, dream team banquet all Friday night, Saturday ran the same program here. And I'm in the back saying, Lord, you got to give me strength. Y'all miss it. This fourth service, say, Lord, you got to give me strength. I ask these people to come to this service. They need the same kind of focus and delivery and anointing. They don't need to be shortchanged, but I don't have the energy. But when I stepped on the stage, I stepped into something. I stepped into energy. I feel my help. The energy is in the obedience. It's in the obedience. So the text says, when they tired, Jesus said, hey, stop what you're doing. That's, see, that's a whole, that's a, they wash their nets and Jesus tell them, stop. I need to use your boat. So Peter stop, pushes out a little bit. Jesus sit down in the boat. He teach. Peter got to sit and wait till he done. (laughs) 
Then when Jesus is done teaching, he says, all right, push out deeper and let down your nest for a catch. Peter say, I've been doing this. Okay, preacher. You telling me to do what I've already done and it didn't work. You told me the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous. I've been doing that. And now you're telling me to do it again. So you're telling me something I already have been doing and it didn't work. And I did it and it didn't work when I had more energy. <laughs> Woo! I did it when I had more faith. Now you're telling me to do it. I'm out of energy and I'm out of faith. And I spent all this time washing these nets and you want me to get them dirty again. For nothing it doesn't make sense but nevertheless I want to know does anybody have a nevertheless in you I want to walk out past and never come back nevertheless I want to give them a piece of my whole mind but nevertheless nevertheless at your word how let down the nets they let down the net and here's what the Bible says it says I'm gonna see who catches this prophetically that that did you hear what I just said Pro, uh, w w prophetic teaching there's a timeless truth that's delivered in a timely manner so the truth is timeless but when it's delivered, it's timely. That makes it prophetic. Listen to me. Text says, when he throws down the net and brings it up, it's so much fish, the net began to break. Their infrastructure was unable to handle the overflow that came into their life. It was a net breaking blessing. Listen, they would have been satisfied with a few fish because they had caught nothing. They would have been satisfied with a net half full of fish. But Jesus will do exceedingly and abundantly above all you ask or think. And the text says, they signaled, watch the text, to their partners. Luke made sure we knew who they signaled to. They didn't just signal to anybody. Now that my boat is full, I'm not signaling to people who weren't around when my boat was empty. Because if you are not willing to be around when my boat was empty, I don't want you to hang around when my boat is full. And that's some people's problem. They've been dealing with you based on the current condition of your boat. They, 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 don't, they, don't, they don't understand the power or the principle of providential partnerships. 
providence, God's providence, pro video, God's ability to see before how he orchestrates everything according to the counsel of his own will. Because God sees before. He will connect you with people before. You see what he sees. So sometimes God connect you with somebody not for where they are. But he connects you with someone for where they're going. And some people are living with the attitude of an opportunist and not assignments. So they missing divine connections and they chasing after people whose boats are full now. Not realizing God's about to give somebody a net breaking blessing. It's so much I'm not tired. There's so much. Both of the boats begin to sink. And none of this would have happened if he would let Jesus have the final word on when he's finished. I want you to see the catalytic nature of this. I want you to see, I want you to see the implications of their obedience beyond them. Because if Peter the Bible says it's P, it's everything hinges on Peter. So James and John boats full. Because Peter obeyed. Because when you quit, you're not just quitting on you. There are implications for your quitting beyond you, which is why God is so invested in you finishing. Because whose boats stay empty? Because, because you allowed or I allowed failure, frustration, or fatigue to cause us to say we finish. Failure, frustration, and fatigue, it's a real thing. But it's not permission. It's real. But it's not permission. It's not permission to quit. They miss all the fish. If they finish when they say they finish, if they let failure say when they finish, if they let frustration say when they finish, if they let fatigue say when they finish, they miss out on fish. And the fish represent, number one, favor. That's not the only boat Jesus could have used. Jesus getting in that boat didn't benefit Jesus. He didn't need the boat for water. He chose the boat for water. He walked on water. He could have walked on the lake and talked. It's favor. And favor felt like a burden. Favor God on me. It feels like a burden sometimes. But if, they, if he let failure, frustration, or fatigue have the final say, what happens? He misses out on some favor that's waiting on him on the other side of the desire to quit. There's some favor that hovers like a cloud and you get to a certain place. See, there's a series I was going to do. I'm trying to figure out where to put it back in. I was going to do, I had to switch it up. It was going to be called Unlocked. And I was going to talk about seven keys that unlock access. And I was going to talk about doors. Uh, and there are certain doors that only require all you got to do for it to open is to get close. You don't have to turn a handle. You don't have to turn a knob. You just have to get in proximity and the sensors on the door will make some stuff open. And there's some stuff that'll open for you 
if you just get close. But if you stop walking before you get close to the door, then a door that could open won't open. Because you miss favor when you quit. You miss fulfillment when you quit. Here's the thing. Quitting prematurely eases one set of agitation, but it creates another. Because you were working for something that you didn't get, and that's why you quit. But when you quit, you still don't have it. And you're further away from it. Because you're no longer working toward it. So there's not fulfillment. It's the highest form of compensation. Yes. Yes. Until you have this, no matter what you have, yeah. you will always feel poor. Yes. If you are not rich here, you can have a high standard of living, but you will not have a high quality of life. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Your fulfillment is on the, it's so frustrating. I know it. I know it's frustrating. But it's on the other side. I'm done. Fish represent favor. They can represent fulfillment. Fish can also represent finances. See, it was an agrarian society. They, 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 would change, they would exchange like goats and animals as a form of currency. They'd exchange crops as currency. So fish, Peter, they didn't eat all of that fish. They were fishermen by trade. They would exchange it. And there, there's some tangible financial blessing. It's not the only way God blesses, but it is a way God blesses. Does that make sense? It's not the only way. It's one of the ways. Now, I want you to catch this. Income, or it's, it's not about income. Why do I need, why do I need fish? I need fish because fish give me options. Not, not cars, clothes, cribs, if you want, whatever. As long as you're not putting it before God, God don't mind you having things if things don't have you. That's, that's fine, right? As long as you don't have to violate kingdom values to get it, whatever. As long as, long as it's not greed, which is idolatry, whatever. And say, well, greed, greed, greed's relative. Just because somebody has more doesn't mean they're more greedy. I'm not even going to bother that. Anyway, anyway, here's the point. It's options. And I'm done. We, we were on a recruiting visit with my son from one of his schools, one of the schools that's recruiting him. We're sitting with the head coach in his office. And my son's like 20 scholarship offers or whatever. But when I was 26 years old, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like 20. But when I was 26 years old, um, I think it was even before he was born, we, we sat with a guy named Saul Hicks and we started devising a plan to put stuff away, even for our kids, college, whatever. Yeah. So here's the point that I'm making. The, the coach is asking, you know, he's, he's talking to Gabe, and I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm like, when are you going to talk to me? <laughs> and he was like, not really talking to me. So I inserted myself in the conversation. I said, I want to talk about three things I need to see for me to feel comfortable. Releasing one of the most important things on earth to me, to you. I say, because if it all go bad, it's on me. God forbid he, th he blow out his knee. I got him. I'm no coach not bringing him to his house. I know if, come on, am I making sense? That's my, that's my assignment. And so I say, hey, here are three things that I would need to see for me to feel comfortable giving over to you one of the most important things on earth to me. And I say, and they have nothing to do with football. And then I said, I have to have these things because by God's grace, I told the coach this, by God's grace, wherever he wants to go to school, 
even if football's not involved, he can go. You got, you got me? I wanted him to know, we, I know your intentions are pure. Praise God. This is one kid you're not rescuing. You're not saving his life. He's good. He's good if he don't even go to college. He's good. And I, I almost got emotional heading back to the airport. Because sometimes I wrestle with the tension. I traveled a lot and things of that nature. Worked really hard. Writing books, building businesses. Worked really, really hard. And I uh, traveled a lot. And sometimes it's like, you know, as a dad, it's like, okay, you got to got to be there then I got to provide it's, it was like it was a lot in a certain season and um, I, I got emotional almost got emotional in the car and I said to myself Lord this why and I said to myself thank you for allowing me to be able to give my boy options My wife, I've never been more amazed at my wife than I am in this season. Watching her take care of her mama. I have never, we're 44, I met her at like 19. I have never been more amazed at what I've seen her do. Go get her mama dressed before she come to church. Like, I've, I've never been more amazed. And so, we're trying to figure out some things with her mom, and she's looking at certain, she's looking at certain places and things of that nature. She's like, a, I can't do that. We're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do that. And I'm like, God, thank you. We got options. We just have to take whatever somebody gives. I'm done. This is what this is about. And so the Holy Spirit spoke to me about something, and I told Pastor Shamika this. He said, Darius, it's your job as a spiritual leader to do what you can, not just to make sure that's happening with your family. That needs to happen with spiritual family. And in church, I'm not critiquing. This is not a critique. This is love. In church, all we talk to you about is giving fish. But we don't talk to you about getting fish because that's what's going to take care of your house. And Jesus told Peter, said, Peter, I want you to use your exp I didn't even have time. There, there's an instance where they need to pay taxes. And Peter's like, we don't have it. Yeah. Jesus told the fisherman, go fish. Yeah. And he caught a fish and opened the mouth of the fish and the coin was in the fish. Yeah. Say, your options are in your expertise yeah. that you're not using. If you fish, fish. If you cook, cook. If you lead, lead. If you consult, consult. If you paint, paint. If you write, write. If you sing, sing. Use your gift because that creates your options and so often in church this is not a critique this is love so often in church all we talk about is fish for God's house when one day you need fish for yours but it's some fish you won't get if you quit. I got to go. I want to pray a prayer real quick. I feel this. I want to pray a prayer specifically for, for people right now who are going through those three F's. Either all three, two out of the three, one out of the three. And you are about to quit. And some of you have quit already. You just hadn't quit. You still in a relationship, but you quit. 
You're not going nowhere, but you quit. Pastor, there's been failure. I'm frustrated. And there's fatigue. I tried the business, it didn't work. I tried this, it didn't work. I failed. I just want to quit. I want to pray for you. I'm not over-spiritualizing this, but I want to pray that God breaks the pattern, the habits, even the spirit of give up. I'm not saying there's a spirit called give up. I'm saying that the enemy will influence us to give up. And some of you saying, Pastor, I'm so tired. I'm tired. I don't know if I got anything left. That's okay. I got a, a prayer list and I pray for our church every morning that I pray. I use the Acts prayer model and I, I pray. And I pray over faces. I pray for names I know. I pray even for like specific needs and uh, as my wife's been caring for her mom I've been way more sensitive to people who are living with sickness and the mental toughness it takes to get up every day and say I just want to feel good I don't know how much we know feeling good is a blessing So I don't know what you're tired of, but I know you're tired. And that's why God gave me this message. But the scriptures say, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. So Father, I pray now for renewed strength over every heart, every person that is wrestling with failure, frustration, or fatigue. Would you renew their strength? Would you give them a second win? so that they can run on and see what the end will be. In Jesus' name, amen. I kept you late today, I'm sorry. (laughs) 